<laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about something I never talk. I haven't talked about in a really long time. So forgive me if it's um, a little rough. But um, you know, I began my career as a photographer, and it's still the only thing I ever really properly studied. Um, I always joke that it's or now that it's as if I learned how to be a candle maker like in, incredibly well, and then somebody turned on the electric lights because I have all these skills, I, um, just an unbelievable skill set that is totally obsolete that no one will ever, I will never need to do any of these things again. I could do them in my sleep. There, there's, there's so much technical uh, expertise that goes into being a good photographer, or let's say that used to go into being a good photographer, and um, that had actually less to do with what you could see and more to do with the actual execution of the pictures, um, uh, the printing, the developing, all of it, and you know, getting through customs in an airport without ruining your film, et cetera. So you know, this was kind of an in-depth knowledge that just got tossed out the window when digital photography came into practice, which was, I was already in my 30s when that happened. Um, and uh, nowadays, Obviously, with your phone, you can do things that used to take like two weeks or you know years of training. You can just do it with a filter on your on Instagram. So that's what's been really interesting for me now that my kids are old enough to take pictures, is uh, is realizing that they don't actually understand anything about the optics of it. Like it's something that just can be done. It's like a magic trick, and I know that there's a lot of criticism of Instagram and of sort of the contemporary, the contemporary use of images because there's so many and because they seem so curated and people are sh only showing a certain version of their life um, to the public. You know, they're sort of carefully deciding what you see and what you don't. Um, and I think, you know, that's true, but I also think it's always been true. And it's something that's been interesting to talk with my, about with my children in particular because, you know, they're coming into photography um, on a completely digital play in a totally digital place, um, and uh, at at a time also where photography is synonymous with social media, so the sharing of pictures is as active as the making of pictures. Um, but I think that you know, since the beginning of time, what you see in a picture has been always chosen by someone, and I think. It, it, this isn't just a question of how to take a better picture. It's also a question of how you understand what you see in pictures. And because all of us now are like trapped at home, you know, more than ever, we're experiencing the world. Like it's like we're all on our individual spaceships and occasionally we sort of turn on the screen and beam in like friends from abroad or the New York Times or the news or, you know, Angela Merkel. I mean, in my case, I live in Berlin and, um, but you're receiving, you're on the receiving end of all, all things, both emotional and newsworthy and entertaining in the same way, right? You're just like turning on a screen and looking at people. So um, I think images are really important and it's important to think about what you're looking at and how understanding what you see impacts how you see the world. So because we're not really um, given the critical skills to understand and decode these images and kind of start and visually analyze what we're seeing. Yeah, and I, th I think that there's this idea right now that, you know, when you're looking at lifestyle pictures, for example, and somebody's like dinner table looks perfect and yours doesn't, you feel sort of resentful because you think that person curated that. But what you're not thinking about is how the images you're looking at in the news or anywhere else are also curated. And I'm not even calling this out as a bad thing. I think that photography and the sort of practice of photography impacts both what we show people and also how we receive the world. So it's sort of it's a two-way street. And I think it's important now more than ever to think about that. So um, I thought it would be interesting to talk about how my training as a photographer ultimately uh, comes into play with what I'm doing now as a storyteller, um, because it's true. I, I really changed media. I, to me, it doesn't feel as different as it does to other people. But it, it, like to me, I feel like I've been doing the same thing and it kind of evolved into something that, that manifests differently, but it's still the same daily practice. And I think 
maybe it's interesting to tell you how that how that works. But I wanted to start with my three. I, I went through the. I read the newspaper like fanatic. I'm sure everybody does, and um, <clears throat> I always download the pictures that I like most. So I, I always keep them on my phone. I, I'm sort of obsessively take visual notes uh, of things that interest me. And I, I sent Pamela the first my three favorite pictures of this week, just from this week in news stories, because I thought it would be interesting to start just with pictures that all of us have access to. Um, Okay. And maybe you saw them too. Should, should we show the first one from Ohio? Okay, this is the best picture taken in 2020. I think it deserves the Pulitzer Prize. No one's actually asking me this, but I think it's an incredible photograph for many reasons. Um, you know, I think that photography is a combination of visual formality, or let's say the visual and, and the graphics and color and um, how all the sort of different components come together as an actual picture. But I also think that, um, and it's that married to the content in it or the sort of social document that is formed through these things. Now, it would have been possible, of course, to take a picture of this that is not as formally beautiful, but this is actually an incredible photograph. Um, to me, the layers of the story that are in this photograph, like starting with obviously the blonde woman's long hair, then behind her, you know, the American flags, the Trump hat, behind them, the woman with a mask, um, the other woman screaming, but then the, and the way they're sort of seen through these different squares. But then to me, the real magic is this guy on the inside who's turned away from the screaming people who's walking away. Um, and, you know, did anyone, I, I don't know actually how to interact with you from where I am, but um, maybe some of you saw this picture too, and it was in the New York Times. It's taken by a guy named, um, ooh, you know what, I can't, uh, Pamela, can you see my notes on it? His name is Joshua, he's a photographer in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and, you know, to, what's interesting about this picture, obviously, is that these are people who are protesting the fact that the local government is trying to protect them by asking them to stay home. So there's also many layers to unpack in, in that idea that took me, where I'm living in Germany, we don't, we don't have the same relationship to the government here, so I had to really think about it. And then in the days since, it's also been interesting to read about who is kind of agitating this crowd and why and what's behind it. But I think that some, for me, this picture really represents the many layers of the problem. And I find it really interesting. There's also the fact that they're all white. There's the fact that basically this is a red, white, and blue photograph. Um, so uh, I can't hear what you have to say, but if I people think have comments, yeah. they can send them in the chat either to me, Pamela, or to Anna directly. So, you know, I, I, I still experience the world as a photographer. I think for me, the visual is always my first point of entry. And I, and I, when something like this stands out for me, I think about it for a long time after, and I keep going back to it. And this is a picture that's really stood out for me this, uh, this week. Um, maybe you could turn to the next one. Sure. Um, Can you see it, Anna? Uh, no, it's still the same picture. Do other people see the African picture? No. Hmm. How about now? Um, you don't see it, Anna. I don't, I'm not seeing anything. I still see the same picture. Okay, I'm gonna stop share and restart the share. Mm -hmm. So sorry about that. I know. So, um, so, but I think that, you know, photography is a magic trick. It's like this strain, and when you're the one taking the picture, it's a combination, right, of like pursuing something that you wanna say. Oh yeah, this is, this is another one from last week. I mean, this picture is just, I'm gonna admit that I actually wrote to the photographer and, and bought a print of this picture. I, I was so, 
moved by this photograph. I think it's just unbelievable. Okay, so what's happening in this picture is this is social distancing at a community meeting in South Sudan. South Sudan is the most recently recognized country. It's, it's the newest country on earth. It's a country that's obviously had a lot of terrible things have happened in that part of the world and they have now formed their own country. Um, it's a country of 11 million people that has four ventilators. Um, and so this is a meeting in, in a village in which people are being taught how to protect themselves from the virus because there is literally nothing that will protect them except social distancing. And this was about an article, this is from an article about what's happening in Africa. And um, I have a, a big interest in Africa. And to me, I mean, first of all, this is the, the visual, uh, the, just the graphics and the color of this picture, everything about it to me is amazing. And then the people are, it's so moving. I mean, there's a man, there's so many details in it. You know, there's one man, only has one leg. The dog is white. Um, the, the, just the looks on, on people's faces. You know, this is, I, I feel like there's a huge story being told in this picture that goes way beyond documentation of it or information. You know, it's like this is, it almost tells the whole story of this community. I mean, what are they going to do about it? There, it's, all they can do is be exactly the right distance away from each other. That's all, because if 11 million people get sick and there's four ventilators, there's just no hope. And that is really tragic. To me, somehow this picture is unbelievable. And the person who took its name is Alex McBride and lives in the South Sudan. Um, so that was a picture that I downloaded on my phone and, and looked at again and again uh, this week. Uh, and then there's um, a third picture from from the newspaper this week. Um, ah. Yeah. Okay, so this is a picture of a quarantine. A mother took it of her daughter in quarantine in Miami this week. And, um, you know, I think this picture is a little bit more constructed. You know, I think all of these pictures have a, have a sort of collusion of formal construction and um, and story and or let's say documentary material like what's actually happening and um, I just picked the ones that I thought were the strongest visually because they have both a really strong story and a lot of information in them but also something that for me speaks to the magic of photography like you feel like you've never seen it before even though you're looking at something we've seen a girl you've seen a bedroom but you're looking at something you've never seen something you might have seen before but you're looking at it in a completely different way. Do you want to move on? Yeah. Okay. So I thought that was okay. So now I wanted to go back to the very beginning of photography because I wanted to just uh, look at the ways in which photography, like <clears throat> when I was in graduate school, which was like a total nightmare, um, I was the only woman in a class of 10. So the other people were, uh, there were nine guys. And um, it was very, we, we spent a lot of time talking about authenticity and reality and these huge debates about like where the men would say, well, I just take pictures, you know, I just, I just take pictures. Like I just appear on the scene and I absorb the world and, you know, I'm not, I'm not impacting it in any way. And um, I think I just never really bought that idea. I always felt like, you know, you're telling a story, you're choosing where to, where to frame. Um, you know, we don't know what was across the street from that, that meeting in the South Sudan. Like on the other side of the street, there might've been, you know, could have been anything, right? You're, whoever takes the picture is choosing what is in the frame, what story to tell you, how to tell you that story. And um, so I wanted to go back to the very beginning of, um, of photography, because when we look at the past, like photographs of the past, one thing that we all think, and I mean, it's funny because you really notice it when you talk about this with children, but first of all, it's black and white, right? Which makes the past look um, really different from the present, right? And then the other thing is that everyone looks really serious, right? Like this guy looks depressed and miserable, but you know, if you know anything about the technology of it, in order to take a picture in 1857, which is when this picture, what is it, no, 1878? 78. 
78, this one's 78, okay. I looked at a whole bunch that were from the mid 1800s. If you look at pictures from that time, right, the exposures were so long, you needed so much light to, to activate the silver gelatin on the, on the negative that it, you had to sit still for like three or four minutes. Now, people can't sit still smiling, right? You couldn't sit there like <laughs> four minutes. So in all of those pictures, people are always looking like this. And as a result, we feel like everyone was depressed and miserable in the past, which of course is not true. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, the, the other thing is in the early days of photography, they basically did the same thing with photography that they did with painting. There was a way in which photography was kind of a replacement for painting or it sort of followed in painting's footsteps and people weren't really making work that was speaking to the actual medium for a while, right? I mean, they did portraits, like once in a lifetime photographs of people like this guy. It was like, this is his life. This is this guy, he's very serious all the time and possibly miserable. Um, and then they photograph landscapes and then sometimes like fruit or uh, vegetables, you know. So there was a real kind of one-to-one -one with painting. Um, and then I just, I, I picked a few, kind of at random, a few other pictures of, maybe you could show the next one. Yeah, okay, this is Louis Armstrong in 1925. This picture was taken by Irving Penn. And as soon as you see someone smiling, right, it's like all of a sudden it feels like, oh, maybe people were really alive in 1925, right? We suddenly have a completely different impression of what life was like then than we do of 1850, 1878, because he's smiling and because he's got this kind of physicality to him, you know, because by, the, by 50 years later, you could, the, the material was more advanced. So you could take a picture faster. So you could capture someone in motion, you could capture someone smiling, and suddenly photography could do something that painting couldn't which is capture a moment, right? And in the early days, it wasn't, I mean, it was less time that you had to sit there, but you still had to sit there like you did for a painting, but suddenly you didn't. And the evolution of photography, um, you know, from, from this very uh, difficult thing that took a long time to something um, where you could, it sort of came into its own as something that could do something that no other medium could do. You know, mm -hmm. and the evolution of, of portraiture, of course, just then completely changed because suddenly you, you there was something unique in the material that was the, in the images that were produced through photography that um, and that's something that has always felt like magic to me, like from my, the very beginning. And it still does is you can plan a picture and you can, you know, choose what the person's wearing and set up the situation. I mean, you know, Irving Penn over the course of his whole life, took these pictures of people in these, um, he, he created this like studio that was very narrow, like in this corner, and he photographed like everybody famous in, these, in this corner. Um, and you, know, you, can, you can, all of those things you can set up, right? But what you can't set up is like the moment that you capture and it always feels like magic. And um, when, I, when I used to do, when I was doing real photography before digital photography, there was always this time lag, right? You would take the pictures, but you couldn't see them. You, you had to wait until you developed the film. And sometimes like I would take pictures, let's say in Mexico, and then I would have to like just gather the film and uh, eventually come home and eventually develop the film and then eventually make contact sheets and then eventually blow them up, right? So we were talking about, you know, two, three, four weeks lag time between taking the picture and seeing the picture. And it always had this feeling of magic, you know, of, of Christmas, you know, you would just open it all up and be like, look what I got. You, know, you didn't know, you never knew if you got it until you saw it. And um, one of my daughters a couple of years ago built a pinhole camera, which is when you uh, turn a, like a shoe box into a, into a camera. And um, after she built it, according to a, a YouTube video, she was like, so how does this work? Like I put the film in and then I take the picture out. And, you know, again, candle maker. I, I was like, she has no idea how this works. This is amazing that she could think that, you know, that it, like the film would just come out as a picture, right? So there's, you know, the, when you look at the evolution of how, how pictures were made, it is truly magic that we can now just capture these moments so easily and see them right away. Um, so then I, I forget which one is the next one, but it's a sort of, oh yeah. So this is Edward Weston. Um, this, he's 
a favorite photographer of mine. He lived in Mexico in the 30s, but he was American. And um, he, this is, I wanted to use an example of abstraction, right? He photographed the body. He, photo, he did a lot of portraits as well. Um, he also photographed fruit. He photographed toilets. He photographed all kinds of crazy objects. But he, he approached them all as objects, he, formally. Uh, and he was kind of famous for that, whether it was the body or it was a pear or it was, you know, a sand dune. He sort of approached it always as, the, as a shape. And um, I thought this was kind of a funny one, uh, if there were any kids here, because it's just, you know, it looks like a piece of fruit, but it's a butt. And um, it was just an example of how things started to evolve. This is in the 30s, this picture, late 30s or maybe early 40s. Um, so we're getting into sort of mid-century modernism. And um, in the middle of the century, that's when people really started to do things that were deeply photographic, right? Like this is, this is a picture that uses the fact of the lens to distort something and make it into something else. So this is like truly... Um, photographic photograph. Um, sorry, I don't, I <laughs> don't normally teach this, so I don't know what the exact art historical language for this would be, but this is something that really uses the medium photography in an interesting way. Um, and then the next one, which is a David Hockney collage. Yeah, so this is, uh, if you haven't seen the photographs of David Hockney, he's just, I mean, he's obviously also a painter, but his photographs are incredible. And he did a lot of collages using Polaroids or snapshots um, and to create these kind of uh, assemblage portraits of people, um, and sometimes also of landscapes, but many of people and their environment. Um, and, you know, this just the arc of this, these, this picture is from, from the 70s or maybe early 80s. Let's see. Yeah, early 80s. It's you see the sort of evolution of photography being kind of a for replacement for painting that was maybe cheaper, a little faster, to being its own medium and something you could do anything you wanted. Now, I came of age as a photographer in the 80s and 90s. Um, I was in high school when I first started doing photography, and that was in the late 80s. And then uh, in the 90s, I was uh, in college and graduate school, and I was also started working as a photographer. And that was an era where, for me, photography took another jump. And um, I, I could only find a few pictures at home that were, but if anyone's interested afterwards, I can give you a list of people to look up that I think were making a kind of work, which I guess I would call narrative documentary. Um, it, th these are pictures that are a departure because there's a lot happening in the image and because some of it is often set up and it brings together, um, for me, I feel like that era of photography and the ph photographers that I was looking at all the time, the kind of work I was making myself at the time, it was the beginning of the kind of storytelling that I do as a screenwriter. So I brought, I, I have a couple of examples here. Um, yeah, okay, this is a really famous picture from the early 80s. It's called uh, Sunday New York Times. It's by Tina Barney, and it's taken with a really large format camera, really big piece of film. Um, which means it's, it takes a long time to set up this picture. There's no one in this room who's not aware of the camera. And um, she's waiting a long time to decide when to press the shutter. And after she does it, there's only one picture. It's sheet film. So, you know, you take what, this isn't like her snapping, you know, with her iPhone until like, and then looking at the pictures afterwards. This is like one picture, right? And um, to me, there's so many layers of a story that's being told in this picture. Um, about class, about family, about the different generations coming together, um, the fact that they're reading the New York Times, the baby bottle, the mother looking super hectic in the background with the baby who's moving around while the guy is sitting there, um, you know, reading the paper. There's just many, many layers of this picture. And I love her work, this photographer, Tina Barney. And when I first started seeing this kind of work, for me, I was really attracted to this. I, I felt like it brought together a kind of visual formalism with a kind of storytelling that really interested me. I brought a few more pictures of other photographers from the same time. Um, yeah, okay. So this is a picture by Helmut Newton. Um, 
it's a, this picture is entirely set up. It's from a fashion layout in Vogue. And it's obviously about feminism. It's about having your cake and eating it too. But it also has many layers. And this is a very deliberate picture, um, you know, where, you know, here's this woman, she's looking sexy. She's got a screaming baby. She's also got, you know, there's so every single thing that's in this picture has been chosen to be there and is there. Um, there's a bunch of other photographers that I just didn't have any pictures here at home. They're all in my office um, who also constructed pictures. Um, Helmut Newton is particularly, you know, most of his work is super sexy. It's like mostly done in the realm of fashion, um, even though it's also artwork, but it's, um, you know, most of his pictures were made for fashion magazines, but there's a number of other photographers from the same era who uh, set up pictures like Gregory Crudson, uh, Sally Mann, um, and we can post um, on Facebook yeah. and on Instagram some of your further reading suggestions of some of your yeah, favorite or just like I mean, the, the yeah. amazing thing now is if you're interested in stuff like this, you can just Google it. Whereas, you know, when I was in my 20s and like obsessed with looking for these kinds of pictures, you either had to like find a magazine with it in it, or you had to go to the MoMA and look for it, or you, you know, one time there'd be a show and you would get to see it once. And um, then you had to buy the like $50 book. Uh, with the picture, in it. you know, it was, it was, uh, you couldn't just take a picture of it or Google it. So it's, it's a amazing thing that you, to me that you can just look up the history of photography uh, so quickly. But um, anyway, so that's, that's one example. And then um, uh, I brought, oh yeah, Nick Wapplington. So this is a photographer from England. And uh, in the 90s, he did a, I think he spent a couple of years photographing a housing project in, um, in, England and it's this series of pictures called living room and it's just an amazing social document like it it, it says everything about the um, the everything that is that even the joy the, the terrible things about life in a housing project but also the joy of family life and the imagination of children and there's this it's a series of pictures that are just incredible and um, there's a lot also obviously visual, they're visually extremely strong graphic images, the colors, the, the way he uses the frame. And um, for me, this series of pictures was also really influential. I was just amazed at the merging of like kind of an interest in understanding something with a kind of visual formalism. So, um, you know, I think when you're taking pictures, I think there's two things. There's the looking at pictures and then there's taking your own pictures. Um, you know, I think it's always really, if you, if you, something strikes you, whether it's the story in it or the way it looks, um, I think it's interesting to collect pictures and then afterwards look at a series of pictures that you've sort of just collected on your phone. I mean, now you can just save them on your phone when you see them. Um, and think about what you're, what it is that you're drawn to. You know, I, I do this a lot because I do a lot of mood boarding for my work, for writing. Uh, I, I find my way into the stories that I write through pictures. And often I can see them before I can write them. Um, so I always feel like I'm like a photographer who writes. Um, and so I think collecting images that strike you and thinking about what strikes you about them is, um, in a way, an opportunity to look at what you were thinking about and how your thoughts about it are evolving. Um, I don't mean just as an artist, I mean also just as a person, um, especially right now since we're all not seeing the real world very much, but rather everything through imagery. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I brought a, a I, I, you know, if I were in my office, I could show you like what a full mood board looks like, but I brought, if any of you have seen Unorthodox or if you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix, you could uh, check it out. But I brought um, a picture that was a real inspiration. You know, we did a ton of Googling at the beginning, you know, just like wanting to, yeah. So this is a picture that we found through Google searching. I mean, it's, we don't know who took it. I wish I did. <clears throat> if I knew who took it, I would get a real print of it, but I have a big uh, color printout of it in the office and I actually had it as my screensaver for the whole year that uh, we were writing the show, making the show. Um, Cause there was just something about it graphically about the color palette. 
about the sort of combination of hectic and chic among the women, about the joy in what they're wearing, um, the sort of, the, just there's so much about this picture that struck me. Um, and we talked about it a lot in the office with all my collaborators. I don't know, this just kind of, this picture became our kind of, there were also pictures from, uh, you know, the, the, um, the show is inspired by a book and in the book there were pictures from from the person's life who who wrote the book but those pictures for some reason weren't the ones that i kept thinking about or that we kept talking about um but this picture was just about women's lives in that community was was really made a big impact on all of us and um and i think that it set a real tone in terms of the, the color palette that we used in the show and um an approach to what they're wearing, um, and just something something magic about about the whole project. And I I just brought two stills from the I didn't I just don't have so much stuff at home, but I brought two stills from the um, from the show, and maybe it's interesting for you to look for. Um, maybe you can see the relationship, maybe not, <laughs> but I think it's interesting because you know. Also, you know, I created this show with with a friend of mine who's um, also, she's a director, so she also has a background in uh, a visual background. And you know, I think both of us come to story through pictures or through images and through color and through and that was something that was really uh, exciting. And and I think I like when I I approach storytelling especially now this kind of cinematic storytelling, I think for me, it's a, it's a merging of two things that interest me, just as when I was doing that kind of photography uh, in my 20s and 30s, I think it, I'm really attracted to the same thing, which is, a com which is bringing together this kind of artistic visual formalism with a deep dive into something that I don't really understand and, and telling a story about something, building a story about something that I'm also learning about uh, while I'm writing it. And um, so I think that uh, I, so I just- I think you're probably also drawn to anthropology, no? Oh yeah, oh, for sure. No, I, I, this, um, I, my mother I think is, is here somewhere. <laughs> I can't actually see who's watching, but I, I saw my mother briefly. Um, yeah, my parents are anthropologists. I mean, this is just a personal thing and um, they, they were never particularly interested in the visual, but they were deeply interested in understanding everything they were looking at. Um, and the conversations that around me growing up were always about that. Um, and, you know, and I, I think that my work is, I would say this, they might not, but I would say that my work is very much an outgrowth of their work. Um, I think when I was just doing, when I was just making pictures, they found it kind of alienating because they, they they didn't really see their work in my work in the same way, but um, but I think more they understand it now, because they also see you know I make another TV show um, that is about uh, East Germany and it 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 takes it's about an East German uh, Stasi officer who's sent a, undercover in the West, and a huge a big that's the first TV show I ever made and it's um, it's we have a, had a big conversation on that show always um, about how you depict East versus West, how you kind of um, make manifest how he feels when he goes from one side to the other, how the world feels different to him. And um, <coughs> so the color palette, the, the visual formality, the style with which that is shot is also a huge part of the storytelling. So I think, um, you know, if it's, uh, if you if you're interested, you might check that out. I, I brought that I'll show at the very end, a slideshow of still photography from our second season, which was shot um, half in Africa and half in Germany. And um, we always work with the same photo still photographer who also shot this picture that you can see now. And um, she's, super talented and I you know I, I will fly her all over the place because I feel like she's she's actually South African because she sees things kind of the way I do and she she brings this kind of heightened drama and marries it with this sort of documentary realism that, that attracts me to all these different 
um, subjects. So, so I, I brought for the very end a slideshow that we made of her work from Deutschland 86, which was our second season. And um, I thought that might be interesting, but it, maybe I should take some questions. Sure. I, I just thought it was interesting that the actress's um, shirt in this picture is the same color as the yeah. bricks in the, the mood board picture that you showed us before. I, did I bring another There might picture? be one more. Yeah, okay. This is a picture that I took when we were on. I actually set this up for fun when we were on set in New York because of that original picture. I just, I had to get myself, I had to get that picture with the bricks in the background and all those sort of badass ladies in their turbans. So this picture was my homage to, and, and you can actually see um, Kim who works with me, who by the way was an extra six times on this show. So we have an amazing range of outfits, but she's, the, she's on the, uh, let's see, to, sh to the main character's left uh, or your right, she's a second from behind looking very grumpy, which she also never looks grumpy in real life. So. Just like um, the guy in 1878. <laughs> we're, we're getting um, a question from someone. What drew you, Orthodox was amazing and beautiful. What drew you to the project? Um, well, I think it's actually what drew me to the project isn't so different from, uh, you know, you, if you come here, you can be seen. Oh, okay. My, my husband is now in the room. Um, so I think what drew me to the project is, um, the same thing as what drew me to the other project, which is I didn't know uh, that much about it. I was very interested to learn more. Um, I think both stories are um, fish out of water stories. They're stories of somebody who goes into the world looking for, um, in a way, looking for himself or herself. And I, I read the book that inspired Unorthodox and I loved it. But the, the, the memoir is very um, internal. You know, it's, it's very much in her head and in, inside of her. And um, so we had to change things about it to, uh, to sort of activate it for the screen. But um, I was really moved by the book and we, we tried to keep the spirit of the book alive in the, in the story. Um, someone else has a photography question. Um, earlier you said before digital when I was taking quote unquote real pictures, what do you think has been lost in the transition? You know, I, I think the Christmas moment was kind of incredible. Like when you would develop film, of course there's many negatives about that, you know, the chemistry, the time lag, all that. But there was something about the craft of it that was very satisfying. Um, and I do believe that the final product, I mean, you know, really good prints, uh, especially black and white prints, like proper fiber prints that have been selenium toned and whatever are still amazing objects. Um, so I think that another thing is it took longer to make a picture. And as a result, I think people, at least for me, I spent more time framing the pictures, you know? It's been really interesting with my parents because so we have these incredible pictures from my childhood and both of my parents always claim they took them unless one of them is in them and then they can't claim they took it but it's they took incredible pictures when i was a kid and they used to use like this pentax 35 millimeter camera we lived in in kenya when i was little and they have these amazing pictures okay then they got when the first kind of digital cameras came around um their pictures, and they were still in just as interesting places, but their pictures just like completely fall off. Like they're just, you know, there's like the glass in the middle and then the, they've stopped, they stopped framing the pictures. And I always tease them about that, but I think that that's probably true for all of us. You know, you can take so many pictures that it doesn't really matter. So there's, there's less time spent framing the picture and really thinking about what picture you want to take or what you want to say. and um, so sort of the craft of, of telling a story with one image uh, is left to the people like the amazing photographers who took those three pictures that we started with. Um, it's not that people aren't doing it, but I think, you know, laymen don't, don't spend as much time thinking about it. And I, I would include myself. So, um, you know, when you're, when you're making uh, television, when you're filming something, you, ha you still have to take a long time to set it up, you know? So maybe there's, a way in which we can uh, 
spend more time considering how, how things are framed. And I, I'm not a director, but, you know, and I'm not a cinematographer, but I, I always choose to work with um, directors and, and cinematographers who are highly visual, like that's really important to me and whose sort of vision of the world jives with my, with how I see the, the material. So, um, yeah. Anna, just a, another question about Unorthodox, because it, because it came out on Netflix, it came out simultaneously in dozens of countries around the world, um, many of which were under confinement because of the pandemic. So can you talk a little bit about how it was received in different places and were there places that, that um, were very interested in it that surprised you? Yeah, I mean, it, the, the whole, the global drop of something, I mean, if you just, when I think of all the things I ever did in my life, nothing has ever been like this, you know? Um, even, you know, Deutschland, the other show is on in like 150 countries, but always at different times and on different channels and whatever. It, this is an incredible thing. It's like, it just suddenly drops in the whole world. I think it was like 192 countries or something at the same time, or some crazy number, like 89, I don't know, 189. Um, and if you marry that with social media, right, you have the fact that everyone's watching it with the fact that they can talk to each other about it, which is this like incredible global conversation about something. And, you know, we, uh, you know, we're all sitting at home on our sofas. We didn't do any live events, right? We didn't go to any festivals, none of the things you would normally do because we couldn't. Um, and so we were just experiencing um, just, just basically, we were experiencing how people were watching it through social media ourselves. And it was just incredible to watch uh, people pick it up in, well, the two places that were most surprising, of course, were, were the Arab world and Latin America. So in the, I mean, in Latin America, they've gone totally crazy for it, which is wild for us, you know? We didn't even think of that. They, they have had so much to say about it. They, they deeply relate to it. They really relate with the character. And they, you know, they keep telling us about how, how Catholicism relates to Judaism. And you know, so there's a whole conversation about that. They want to know so much. And, um, but also in the Muslim world, right? Yeah, in the Muslim world, it's been really touching. Like um, the, there were people who said things like, you know, I've never felt sympathy for a Jew before. Um, there, there's, it's been a whole conversation. It's been a big hit in Saudi Arabia and Turkey and, um, you know, Emirates and Jordan. <laughs> so yeah, that's been, it, that's been wild. And, uh, you know, it has been less surprising for us that it, that it was popular in New York and in places where we are, you know, let's say in, in France, people have really liked it also. Um, in Italy, you know, I've, I've done a lot of interviews with people in Italy who've been um, also in lockdown for like even longer than we have here. And, you know, there is something very moving about the fact that everybody, all these people are watching it at the same time. And, you know, we're really grateful that it can give, you know, that it's a kind of bright spot in a, in a really dark uh, moment. We have one last question um, uh, before we go to your slideshow, which is what were the responses from the Orthodox Jewish community to the show? Yeah, so, I mean, we had a lot of people from the community who worked on the show with us. Um, people who, who had left the community or were sort of half in and half out. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about the details. There was a lot of um, concern about what their moms would think and stuff. And then, of course, officially they weren't supposed to watch it, but a lot of people have watched it anyway, including um, our Yiddish translator who left the community in his 30s, who's a really amazing guy named Ellie Rosen. His mom watched it and she's like, she told him, you know, I, I turned it off right away because I didn't like the nudity, but there isn't nudity till episode two. So, you know, <laughs> and then also, um, then she said, he said, is that all you have to say about it? And she's like, well, you look way better as a Hasid because he plays the rabbi. <laughs> so I think a lot of people have, have watched it and, and generally speaking, people have, have actually really liked it. We've had really positive responses and especially from young people in the community who've watched it on non-kosher phones. You know, they have kosher phones and non-kosher phones. So uh, kosher phones uh, block the data so they can't see things like Netflix. But if you get a non-kosher SIM card, you can watch um, Netflix. And um, judging from all the people who like 
approached us and, and sent us notes and sent notes to the actors. And I mean, it's just incredible. I think a lot of them have, have really uh, been moved by it. 